part of a crash course I started um, in order to alleviate any kind of anxiety people have about using this raw material, which we've grown, I guess, accustomed to to be intimidated by it. And so um, I want to show you some traditional techniques, as well as some of my own techniques. And every single class, because it's so short, it's two hours long, um, there's really so much I can say. It's not a very hands-on kind of approach. And so I, I try to just shoot as much information as I can. And I feed off of your questions. And this way, we can both have a kind of dialogue. Uh, my name is Roger Carmona. And I'm the general manager here at Camera Pigments. And um, I'm primarily uh, I'm a painter, um, but I'm, I'm an artist. So I make sculptures and video and audio stuff as well. Um, but I, again, I'm very focused in, in, in alleviating some of that anxiety you might have or might not have, or just some questions you might have about working um, with traditional materials. And again, it's part of a three-part crash course. This is the first one is on ground and pigment explanation. Um, and so I show you how to make different kinds of, of uh, gessos. And I explain the, uh, I generally explain the concept of what it means for a pigment to lay on a surface, or for a pigment to lay on, on, on a painting, or any kind of project you're working on. Um, so in a way, I'm, I'm developing this, this, this course where I can give you the foundations to how to use the raw material, and then you can manipulate it in any kind of way that you choose. Um, so I believe, I strongly believe that the most interesting painters are the ones that um, understand their, their material, their ingredients, and can manipulate it into their own kind of personality. You know? And so I, I talk about pigments and I talk about materials as if they were people or food at times, because I think this is the most, uh, the closest that we can um, uh, relate to these to the materials. And I, and I feel a very tactile response to, to paintings in that way. And so I want to um, give you the insights that I have uh, doing research for this company and the insights I have as, a, as an artist. And so I, I hope that um, um, in the development of this course, we can uh, create some kind of rich dialogue or concerns or doubts you might have about um, the way that you're working. And so I'm not, I really want to emphasize that I'm not here to say something is right or wrong because I think that's the complete opposite of what I believe with, with painting. And I think you can stretch it out to, to a lot of them. Um, you can stretch out your ideas and the manipulation of paint, the physical, tactile response to paint. When I say recipes, it's kind of a misnomer because I'm not going to give you exact ratios. And the reason I don't give you, I give you approximations, I guess. And the reason I don't, I don't want to give you exact ratios is because I think uh, paint making is definitely very much like, like cooking in the sense that when you grab a cookbook, they give you specific um, uh, ratios of the ingredients. Um, but I want you to, in your own practice, I, I, I want you to, th um, to think of it a little bit differently. Think of it, um, when I say stretching, I mean try to extend those ratios. Try to, to see what kind of new paint arises. And um, a lot of the fear that people have with experimentation is, uh, is the fear of, um, of it being permanent. And so I think that that's definitely very important. So those max, those max uh, um, levels are, are set for that purpose. Um, but do experiment because you're going to get new, new kinds of, of pain, new, new tactilities, new hard, hardnesses, or new softnesses um, to the paint, uh, where otherwise you, you might not. So I'm going to give you approximations. Um, the first one I'm going to make is, is one oil, an ultramarine blue. And um, a lot of the techniques of how to mix this really depends on how much paint you're going to make. Um, I generally like to make paint as I go because this way I can save, uh, I save on pigments because usually I mix more than what I, than what I need. And so um, in my studio, I, I 
have them separated in jars, and then whenever I need to mix, I mix, I mix it as I go. Um, and this is important for my practice because I like the idea of chance. I like the idea that not every time I make one paint, it's going to be the same. And so I, I feed off of that, I work off of that, I play off of that. Um, but so someone like a violin maker, for example, might want the same exact varnish over and over again. Might want the exact same paint. Or if you're making a large painting and you need to make a background, you want to have a consistent paint. So if you ever um, need to correct your mistakes, you can always make that exact same ratio. You'll have the exact same gloss, glossiness to the paint. And so you can you can measure this out. And the best way to measure would be to have like a scale to measure it by weight rather than by volume. And this can be much more precise in, um, in, in making larger batches of paint. So a lot of times I'll make a small amount of paint, and then I I measure out the ratio, and then I, I test it in, in, in onto the painting. Um, and if I like the way that it, that it finished, the way that it dried, then I know exactly what I have to alter in, in my next in my next uh, in my next paint. So this is essentially just a ultramarine. And when making larger batches, it helps to uh, make a little wall in the middle. So this quantity that you just poured out, would you call that a lot, a little, or a little bit? <laughs> it really depends on what you're making. But I would, sure. for my process, I would say this is a lot. Right. It's a lot of paint, especially when you're working with pigments. Um, this is very true with oil paint. When you're working with uh, pigments and um, Um, not pre-made paint, you have more of a concentration of, of pigment to oil. When you're making with pre-made paint, a lot of companies use fillers in order to extend the oil, and you can do that. Fillers can be all sorts of things. Primarily, it's limestone or champagne chalk or bologna chalk. So I usually start off very, very concentrated, and I try to make a very dry uh, paste. That way I can gauge how much oil I need. The reason I'm using water oil Guano oil is one of the slowest drying oils, but it's also one of the clearest. It has a very thin body to the paint. And I want to kind of make, um, exploit the physical nature of, of the ultramarine blue. Your monitor he has timed out. My monitor has timed out? Yeah, if you shake the mouse, I think it will come back. There it is. <laughs> um, we're ongoing technical difficulties here. One day we'll get it exactly. <laughs> uh, um, so I basically just mix it as I go. I can put a lot and then uh, use more pigment, but I'd rather use it um, very concentrated at first. So at this point you have no ratios, you're just mixing by eye, right? So I'm just mixing by eye. Right. And, and again, one thing you're going to notice is that every pigment has different uh, has, has different rates at which they absorb liquid. Um, the oil as well is going to um, vary with that. It's, it's going to make that um, change. It's going to be another variable to your mix. I really want to make a very concentrated paste because I might want to tube this, or I, or I just really want to uh, use it as a tint to change to change my colors. So even with the same pigment in the same oil, if you use different particle sizes, would that, would that vary the quantity of oil required to achieve the same uh, thickness of the paste? Um, when you say sizes, you mean... Oh, the particle size. Suppose you have... Uh, no, that's not necessarily true. Okay. So for example, like cobalt, cobalt yeah. have, are very fine particle size. They, they range about 8 microns okay. um, to each particle. And so the cobalt dries extremely fast, and it's the nature of the cobalt element. Um, the chemistry in the cobalt makes, makes it dry very, very quickly. So as you can see, can you still see this? As you can see, uh, it's, it's a very thick paste. But um, to your eye, this might look very well mixed. But there are some particles that not, might not be coated with individual oil molecules. And so what's really helpful is to use a muller. A muller has an abrasive surface in the bottom. And I'm using a non-core surface like glass. Uh, it's the easiest to clean up. And um, when you're making a large batch, you can essentially make number eights. 
and it allows it to, to mix really well. I usually just push it down. And then you can see that it's like it needs a little bit, it might need a little bit more oil. But I try to make it as concentrated as possible first. And I'm using two palette knives because this way I can make sure that every single particle is being pushed along the oil in the oil. And the, the physical nature of ultramarine is also very fine. It's a very rich color. It's somewhat semi-transparent. Um, and of course, the medium dictates whether how transparent or how, you know, how opaque it is. So all these are, are variables, but I'm showing you right now what what wand of oil is. Is time another variable or it's not? It can be or it cannot be. I'm choosing um, water oil because I want this to dry very slow. Um, the painting to your right is an example of different grounds. And um, I'm going to use this painting kind of as an example of how paint ages in time. So I'm going to continue to paint this painting with you um, in my courses. And so right now what I want is this very strong, rich, rich blue. I'm going to put this in my palette. So generally I have two mixing stations. I have one where I mix the paint. So the consistency of what you've just done, you would, you would describe this as thick and not runny, am I correct? No, I would describe this as runny, Okay. Um, very oily, and uh, this would be like one of the, one of the higher layers, but I still want there to be some kind of transparency. And the reason I'm doing it um, thin is because I'm going to do a very thin layer that I want it to stay open or, or wet for a long time. That way I can work back into it. I notice you did not add any extenders or fillers. I'm not adding anything to it. I want a very rich blue. Okay. And as a disclaimer, I'm not <laughs> I'm not using anything that's toxic. We are in the basement. Um, and I don't want um, uh, particles to be flying around, so I'm not using also anything that's extremely light. Whenever you're working with pigments, I would suggest if you're making a large batch of paint, I would suggest using a no shell certified mask, um, something that will uh, filter out um, up to half micron sizes. You use it yourself, sir? I do. I use it. I use it uh, as much as I can, even though even if the even if the product is non-toxic, because then I just get uh, accustomed to it. Um, though there are times, you know, when I get very, I, I can get lazy, or there are times when I'm making like a gestural mark, and I, I I paint with music, and music has a large part to do with with my work, and so it, it's a very gestural based work. So sometimes um, I dance when I paint. And so sometimes uh, a mask gets in the way of my dancing. <laughs> so that's true with, with um, you know, people might say that even with uh, uh, latex gloves. Um, I, I would say the most sensitive part would be your lungs, whether you're inhaling a lot of dust. Even household dust is bad for you. Um, your, your skin is very porous though, and so um, a lot of toxic pigments, say like cadmiums, can go into the pores of your skin. So if you're if you have prolonged exposure to cadmium and you're not uh, controlling the, the, the respiratory system and you're not controlling uh, your your skin, then you're more susceptible to 
um, intoxication from cadmiums or heavy metal poisoning. So you do want to be aware of this, and with, with almost all our products, companies are required to give you material safety and data sheets, and this is something that, that um, you should always ask for, just so you can know what's in your... What did you just use to clean the monitor, sir? I'm using Shell Cell Tea. It's kind of like odorless mineral spirits, and um, I try to take off as much paint as I can with paper towels first, and then I use this very little as turpentine or odorless mineral spirits as much as possible. The second um, paint I want to make is a combination of linseed oil, black oil, and raw umber or natural green earth. Now this is a very traditional um, uh, medium, if you will. It's a very traditional medium for the cartoon or the preliminary drawing of your painting. Um, the reason is because it dries very, very fast, um, and, it, and you're allowed to. You can create tones or you can create value with a very fast uh, painting medium. Um, and what's what's really nice about the green earth is one of those uh, pigments that absorb liquid. So you're getting the the faster drying time from the pigment itself, and you're getting the faster drying time from the lead in the black oil. Um, the black oil is cooked with linseed oil and lead, or, or massacot, litharge. Um, and this is a very traditional medium that Pintoretto um, became known for, but more specifically Flemish painters uh, or Italian painters of the 18th century. And so again, you're able to create a value without uh, using too much of your pigments. And my pigment explanation or my ground class I explained a little bit about levels, or the way that pigment sits on top of, of, a, of a house, if you will. And so, um, the use of raw umber or green earth allows you to create a very flat plane, where, the, where you create a foundation of the house that allows you to develop value through the pigment itself. So you get, what I mean by that is that you get uh, a very dynamic range of light going through the painting. And this is something that you might be interested in if you're trying to look for that kind of glow that you see in Venetian painting. Um, and also, if you don't want that kind of glow, then you know, then you know the physical characteristic that you're working with. That way, um, you can decide what kind of ground you want to paint on. So for example, if you want to make a, a more dull um, kind, of, uh, kind of appearance, then you might choose a darker ground and paint um, and some very opaque pigments on top. And so light is not very is not going through very much. Um, so yeah, this this uh, this medium is it's linseed oil, black oil, with raw umber, or green earth. Raw umber, or green earth works um, equally well. Is the black oil our fiber? Black oil is our fiber. Yes. So it's not prone to any type of cracking. Or no, the cracking, uh, it, it comes into play with those kinds of variables. Um, there's a very, um, something they, te they taught me, I guess, in, in, in art school was, was a very simple rule, rule called fat over lean. And the, the reason you do fat, a fattier paint over leaner uh, paint is because the, the fattier surface is going to take longer to dry. And so whatever you put on top, um, even if it looks like it's dry to touch, um, at a microscopic level, it might not be completely dry. So when you put a, a leaner surface on top, the way that those two different paints are drying are, are going to be too much of a variable. So you won't have too much of a control. And so that general rule of, of fat over lean comes into play. But this one is a very lean paint. And so um, essentially there's, more of, there's less of a risk to cracking. You might get cracking, but you're going to... You're, you're supposed to put layers on top. So in a way, you, you kind of compensate for that structure. Um, so I'm going to use uh, linseed oil. Linseed oil is a very yellowing oil, um, though it's low in acid. And this is cold pressed linseed oil. Cold pressed linseed oil is, is what you would use to store paint. And the reason you would use cold pressed linseed oil to store paint is because the low acid will prevent your colors from changing. It will also prevent it from drying too quickly. Um, um, even though you might want to use poppy oil uh, for cobalt, for example, 
um, because of my explanation, the cobalt tends to dry quicker. Poppy oil dries very, very slow. It's also very, very clear. And so it makes your blues a lot brighter. So cobalt blues, you might want to mix with poppy oil when you're making it into a pre-made paint. If you want to store your paint, is what I mean by pre-made paint. So if you want to store your paint, you do have to be conscious somehow of what, of, uh, what kind of um, oil you're going to use. Um, generally, people use cold pressed linseed oil. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix uh, my raw umber first as a stock paint, if you will, or as a um, tooth paint. So I'm just going to make um, raw umber and uh, cold pressed linseed oil. It's, um, it's very useful to buy droppers um, because, again, you don't waste too much, too much oil in your a lot of times, I like to start off with the pigment and make a wall and then put the oil inside. If you're making a larger batch of paint, the opposite is, is actually better. So if you're making um, a lot of paint, you're, you, um, you can lay down the oil first and then you have a wet surface where the pigment can rest on. So if you're pouring a lot of pigment, the, the, the pigment doesn't get around uh, everywhere as, as quickly. It, doesn't, um, it kind of has a place where it sticks onto. Yeah, just making a very concentrated thing first. You mentioned using several different kinds of oil. Yep. Uh, now, if you use s some of the different layers of uh, paints with different oils, uh, the ultimate oil film, the fact that you used different oils, how would it affect it? It would affect it greatly. I mean, I think the, the reason painters 19th century were called masters, I guess. It's because they had a master understanding, they had a master control of those levels. They, they also um, painted with different oils, but they had an idea of, of every form they were painting, and they had an idea of, of how that form was being painted. And so they adjusted accordingly, based on the pigments and based on the, on the oil itself. So that control of what every form of your painting has, and understanding, keeping a log, a mental log, or a brain log, of the different oils gives you a concrete understanding of how your painting is being developed. So you get a, an overall um, assessment, I guess, or overall hybrid of all these different, and it becomes a, your own unique kind of paint film. And so that is very um, fascinating to me, and I, and I try to do that in my own work. Though some, like violin makers, for example, want a consistent, um, uh, consistent layers, development of layers. And so, um, yes, it's going to affect it greatly um, in the whole matrix or the structure of, of, of what it is, the level plane of the plane of paint or the paint film, um, if you will. So knowledge of the levels is what you are suggesting is a great idea, but you are not suggesting that merely by using the very same oil or different oils, that itself, in and of itself, is going to make for a better or worse film. No. I mean, just you're doing what you're doing. Yes. When you say better or worse, um, a lot of questions come into mind. It can mean, I mean, you mean um, as far as archive, or being archival or, or being permanent? But, well, cracking, and not just necessarily permanent. If it starts cracking in a year or two, yes. it's affecting the visual effect you're trying to create. Yes. You have to have an understanding of, of how your paint is drying understand when you're, you're, you should be able to do the next layer. So again, a lot of the, the, the oilier paint films take longer to dry. So you have to keep this idea of paint, um, the paint film and fat over lean. If you have that basic principle, understanding of it, then you kind of um, analyze the way that the paint is drying, then you, you can have a stronger perception of that. But I, um, you do want to be aware of that. Um, but I, I wouldn't worry too much about it because, especially with using raw materials, you know everything that's in your paint. So you, those variables like fillers, um, you're, you understand what's in your paint. So with, with using pre-made paint, you have no idea what the paint company is putting in. It's, it's very much like food, you know, um, comparing McDonald's to a high-end restaurant, for example. Just a lower quality kind of filler-based um, processed food to something much more richer or more 
of pure, if you will. And so it's 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 that same concept of of, um, of at least knowing where your where your ingredients are, and then being able, and through your development as a painter, then you can have a better grasp of how how uh, this paint is being layered. And I think that's really what I'm trying to just point out. I'm I'm trying to just make aware of that simple ex explanation. And um, giving you the general physical characteristic of each medium will help you understand your, your paint better. So again, I'm just this is a very concentrated paint, and I want a gritty surface, so I'm not going to mull it. I want um, the way that Indian miniature painters control detail. Whenever you look at those paintings, I love Indian miniature paintings, so let's bring back that as an example. Uh, the way they control those fine lines. It's by a slight um, coarseness to the to the ground, so that way you make a line. The coarseness, kind of like in pastels, the coarseness is there to kind of hug your your the tip of your of your um, brush. And so, in Indian miniature painting, you can make this very fine, long, sharp line by a slight addition of coarseness. So, because I'm doing this as a drawing, I want there to be a slight coarseness to it. So, I'm not going to mold it. It's not necessary for my purpose. So, it's a gravity. To the to the paint that I'm making right now, I wanted to I want the raw lumber. If you if you're mixing this yourself, you can hear like little crackling from the paint um, itself. And you know it's a little you know use your senses. It's it's a little coarse and it's it's fine it's fine to me. Um, painting with oils, um, but painting just using just oil, not using any pigment in it, and layering with oil, whether that was sustainable or not, and. Um, I didn't have a question for that person, an answer for that person right away. And uh, so I did a little bit of research. I asked I have, um, a former co-worker of mine, um, Becca Pollock, is now in a really great program up in uh, upstate New York for conservators. And um, so I kind of had her, I kind of had her do some tests on this question. Um, and what what she found was that the the oil essentially doesn't does uh, um, leaving out the pigment doesn't compromise the strength of the oil as long as you do it in thin layers, and so the the oil can still evaporate, can still dry at a, at about the same rate as if there was pigment in it. And the reason I say that is because um, a lot of times um, people are afraid to use too much oil. And um, in, in that whole idea of this matrix um, of balancing different oils, uh, I would say that you can do that. You can put a lot of oil, but you do have to compensate for that, for too much um, oiliness, too much fat. And so um, with black oil, the lead in the black oil uh, allows it to dry very, very fast. Um, lead oil can be somewhat brittle, I mean, lead can be somewhat brittle, um, but with addition of one oil, um, it prevents, it, it, it gives a little bit more stability. Um, previously I said uh, linseed oil and um, lead oxide um, is what we use to make the black oil, but actually, that, that's actually an older recipe. Um, Dr. Kramer is actually making this with one oil, and I assume it's because it has a more fluid uh, uh, kind of um, film. And that's what you want from, from something that's going to help you make a sketch. These are childproof because of the lead. So now this is an example, sorry, no, sorry this is an example of the direct mixing of two oils in the same uh, paste yes. that you're creating. Yes, and I just make a stock solution with cold pressed whiskey oil to make my paint and then I add lead oxide. You can use the lead oxide, lead oxide directly. Um, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't like it personally, just because of the way that it moves. So it. you're using black oil that's made with one oil. oil. Yes, you could also use one oil. Or you could use just straight lead oxide. Or you could just use straight lead oxide. I like this mixture, so I'm doing it. I'm doing it like this. If you can see, you can see some somewhat transparency. So you can see that uh, um, it's going to be very transparent there. Now, as my as my uh, 
ultramarine blue is sitting there, it's going to start to dry up a little bit. So again, this is, um, you put this in your mental notebook and you try to uh, and work with your time here. Same way you would if you were cooking and you gotta like prepare the vegetables before you make the meat or something. Um, you gotta be aware of, of the time when everything is gonna come out. The surface that I'm painting on is a is an oil it's a half oil, half rabbit skin blue um, motion. Um, and it's uh, somewhat porous. You can see the way that the paint is um, it's just seeping right in there. So the base is rabbit skin glue and uh, oil? Oil, yes. And I'm just showing you the coarseness of the, of the pigment and how it started drying immediately. Wow. And it's drying faster than, than I imagined based on my mix because of the um, things that were sitting there. So a lot of times um, we get unexpected unexpected moves, right? As a as a painter, and uh, you you try to adjust, and when you're adjusting, you come up with new uh, unexpected things that are happening in your paint. So it's always okay to adjust as you go. Um, I'm gonna give you. Two different ways of how this, this dries, just by adding turpentine. And uh, depending on the turpentine that you use as well, that's going to vary how it dries. Chelsea tea is a, somewhat of a slower drying, orderless mineral spirits. Um, double rectified turpentine is a little bit oilier, and um, thus dries uh, much slower. And uh, what orderless mineral spirits or natural or turpentine, for example, dries extremely fast. Um, so if you want to, and the way it's flowing is going to be much more even. But you're breaking down the intensity of the pigment. So if you think of, see I can make a sharper line. If you think of, uh, of turpentine that will evaporate, then just think of it as something that's going to aid your, your paint to move around more freely. It's going to evaporate anyways, and the turpentine is not going to stay there. Now, something that's happened to me is when I add too much turpentine, and you see where the the paint film kind of cracks, it kind of shows this kind of uh, icicle or icing kind of effect. Um, turpentine is a solvent. The very last uh, recipe I'm going to give you is a diluter, and the difference between a solvent and a diluter again is, is that explanation. A diluter actually allows you to dissolve your paint and allows you allows the paint to spread more fluidly, but doesn't break down the composition of the pigment as much. And so if you want something that doesn't does not dull out your paint, and you can see it's drying much, much quicker, um, then you might want to use a diluter rather than solvent. And you're gonna see the benefits from using a diluter when, when you do this mix. So I'll give you that recipe. Um, I'll just give it to you now since I'm mixing it. Uh, for that diluter solvent, you can use a balsam, uh, 50, um, one to one ratio between a balsam and a turpentine. And the drying time again is going gonna, is gonna to vary depending on what kind of balsam you use and what kind of turpentine. Um, I would suggest using large turpentine, it's a, it's a very high quality kind of balsam. Uh, I intermix those terms, turpentine and balsam, um, because uh, what we know as turpentine or solvent is a distillation process from the balsam. 
So the balsam, it's uh, um, initially the the first um, secrement, excrement, secrement, sacrament of secretion of of what what comes out of the the tree. And so that would be a balsam. Uh, when you distill it, then you can get a turpentine from that balsam. And so one of the higher quality balsams is a large, large turpentine or large balsam. Um, Canada balsam is by far the highest quality. And it's something a lot of violin makers use. It's very hard drying, so it protects the violin. It's also very, very, very clear. It's almost trans translucent. So you can use a balsam for your lighter colors like blues and whites and yellows. Um, I like silver for turpentine because it's uh, it's very inexpensive and has that um, has a slight honey color to it that will um, make the painting age in a very interesting way. Um, Venetian turpentine is a byproduct of large turpentine. Um, uh, essentially, has colophony and large in it, and then that's your traditional Venetian turpentine. Colophony is a very hard uh, resin, so the combination of a hard resin and a softer large uh, gives you a very interesting um, balsam. So um, with each of those, there's, there's going to be slightly different physical characteristics. But again, when you have control of, of what these differences are, uh, then you can choose what form you paint with what medium. Um, so that first one was, uh, again, was just one oil and uh, The great thing about uh, oil painting is that um, you can really use any kind of any kind of brush. The next paint I'm going to make is a uh, is what I'm going to call a very light paint, a kind of fluffy paint. Um, and this is somewhat difficult to do with uh, oil because of the weight of oil. Um, what, what what's ideal to use is uh, acrylic paint. Um, <coughs> The next, uh, the next uh, class I'm going to give is, uh, is acrylic paint. Um, so a lot of times when you're making volume, acrylic is much lighter. So for transportation or, or just for uh, um, taking care of the work, it's much more uh, efficient um, and easier to use acrylic paint. And then you can paint on top of it with oil if you wish. But I'm going to show you how to do this regardless with, uh, with uh, oil paint. One thing to keep in mind whenever you have accents like this is to make sure you, you bag the, pa the paper towels and throw it away immediately. Um, don't let it sit around your studio because it can spontaneously combust and create a fire. In your personal experience, has that ever happened? Never. Well, but it uh, has I happened to I know a whole family died in our family. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Was it rags, something like that? The rags were uh, not supposed to fall. We had a co-worker which happened as well too, but I've never been that close on that. But is that from the solvents or the oils themselves? From the oils, it's um, spontaneous oxidation. It's like oxidation from oxygen. It's an exothermic reaction, so it generates heat. And find it in a small area, then you can set the whole thing in a chain reaction. Well, it's interesting though because the uh, airline restrictions for traveling with oil paints, right? Uh, from what I understand, the explanation why it's okay to travel with oil paints is because they're vegetable based. And for some reason, that's a, that's a, what a higher. Uh, no, it's because you don't expose them to oxygen. Mm -hmm. That's why it's exposed to oxygen is when the exothermic reaction starts. Okay. So if they're inside a container, it should be safe. Okay, so I'm going to use Alkyd Resin 8H, which is this thing here. Um, it's a petroleum-based uh, oil. It's a combination of natural oils, uh, plastics, essentially. 
Um, it's a very fast drying oil, very, very hard pink film, very, very glossy, and it smells somewhat strong. So I'm not going to make a large batch of it. Um, but I use it because of its viscosity, and I use it because of its fast drying time. So, for example, this is important because it is important when you try to throw paint. Um, if you ever try making kind of impasto, uh, if you ever want to throw the paint and you want it to land exactly where it land, where you want it, you know, where you threw it, then you want something that's very viscous, very heavy, and fast drying. That way, the oil doesn't um, take too long to dry and it doesn't start to to sink. Um, so that's why I'm choosing uh, Alkyd Resin Oil. You can use standard oil, uh, which is just linseed oil that's been polymerized, um, but this will, will take uh, much longer to, to dry. If you don't keep this well covered, it will dry out very fast. Someone could see this or not. Yep. It's very viscous. And I'll try to work fast so it doesn't smell in here. I'm going to use, uh, because I want volume, I don't want um, intensity so much. I'm going to use Studio Yellow, which is a very strong, high tinting strength uh, pigment. It's uh, very, very opaque, so it's a good substitute for cadmium, which is much, uh, much more toxic. This is not toxic at all. What's it called? Um, Studio Yellow, it's 23850. And um, uh, I'm going to use this because I, I just want a strong, intense yellow. Um, but I don't, and I don't want to use too much pigment, also for reasons of cost. What would that bottle cost? Uh, 20, 20, 20 grams cost $12, okay. and 100 grams cost 25 okay. But for me, for yellow especially, I use a lot of it. Um, you know, something like this, is, it's not important for it to be vibrant in yellow. Um, I want a form that's going to be somewhat dull, but again, it has a lot of volume. So I'm just mixing this. As you can see, I only did alkaline resin. I didn't mix any other oil in it. This is the polymer resin. Yeah. So technically this is an acrylic, it's not even an oil paint. No, it is an, it is an oil paint. There's a oil like polymers. I see. You can always use foam in the bottom of your palette, that way it's smooth. Or I have a home with an extremely thick glass that doesn't move at all. So I'm making it a little bit oilier than I want because I'm going to add a filler to it and it'll give it that volume. Would uh, like galloping and liquid would it be like the commercial? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, I mean, you can find all these products at, you know, anywhere. I'm giving you, we generally just call it by the wall material. But again, the MSDS sheet, material safety and dash sheet, generally tells you what, what that color is or what that um, material is. So if another company has some kind of radical name for it, you can always find what the pure source is. This is just champagne chalk. It noticeably changed the, 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 the hue. Well, at this, at this moment it looks like it is, but um, champagne chalk is actually very transparent. Well, not the hue, I mean the intensity. Yeah, it will change the intensity a lot. Yeah.
So we can see it's a very kind of viscous paint. anti-settling agent and um, when we sometimes talk about paint we talk about it as, um, as if we're going to eat it I guess so we say stuff like buttery paint um, this will give you a buttery paint um, and it's an anti-settling agent so you would also use this uh, when you're in a tube it. when you're in a tube it you use about 10% between 5 and 10% in volume of what your your uh, your paint is, and that just prevents it from separating the two, the oil from the pigment. And that does lose, makes it lose intensity. So I'm just mixing it right in here. And it starts to thicken up my paint a little bit, even more volume. Very much like go, the more you do this, the more air you're, you're making the paint um, receive, and so you're gonna start to more volume. The more you do this, the more volume you, you, you give it. But um, the faster it starts to dry. Just FYI, your video feed has stopped. It's not. It's not the mouse. It's it died. Yeah. Well, it's frozen. Yeah. The timer still. The time's still going. Yeah, the time's moving, but the image is frozen. Slowly getting better at it, but the battery died. Ah. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, the more you you mix it, the more air you're going to get in it. And at this point, I want even more aluminum stirry, so you can just directly add more to it. So you, I'm you see confused it? about that, sir. You're saying more air gets in, uh, mm -hmm. the more you mix it? The more you like, yes, the more you mix so it. So the emulsion more. has uh, small bubbles in it, is what you're saying? Yep. That's exactly what the aluminum stereo is, is, is. It's a soap, the aluminum stereo, isn't it? No, it's not a It's not a kind of soap. I'm not exactly sure what the chemical compound is. Uh -huh. But they're kind of like, uh, they expand the way that, um, uh, like hollow glass bubbles expands. Um, hollow glass bubbles is another alternative, but essentially at this point you have a very viscous paint. Um, wow. They just start creating a lot of, a lot of volume. So you can just throw it, and at this point it can still take more aluminum steric and it can still work a little bit more. Um, there's other options like bentonite, or like I said, hollow glass bubbles works really well. Um, but the, the, the tricky part with oil is because of the weight, it doesn't allow it to expand as much. Um, so the only way that you can create volume is by, is by doing that a lot, but then the paint starts to dry. So again, you can do this with acrylic and paint with it on oil, but that's one example. And did you say that the aluminum stereo sort of delts the color? It does. It's just more... It's just more... Uh, more filler. You're, you're, you're in the spectrum of light. 
it's replacing, it's being replaced with a, a translucent material rather than pigment. So the intensity of the of the, of the color is going to start to diminish. I'm going to put a lot just to test what happens. So at this point, it's more, it's more like a 200% aluminum stereo. To the initial paint. So is that going to make it more buttery? No, I don't think so. I think it's going to um, dry out and crack. Uh, but what I'm interested in to see is to see if the panel surface is porous enough where it's going to hold on to whatever paint I make. And if it cracks and it looks like a piece of plaster on there, then it's okay. I can probably use that at some point. Um, and what I mean by it being archival is that if, it's, if the panel is porous enough, then I'll kind of cling on to, the, to that surface. And it will be permanent in its own state, so it's become almost like an object. And I'm showing you this just as, 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 a, as a way to give you freedom to really play with the paint. Wow. So that was twice as much aluminum steering in the second application as compared to the first? Yes. Actually, no, it's more like five times. Though. Five times as yeah, much? Yeah, I did a 200% in volume of, wow. of pigment to... And again, you've seen the way that the gravity is pushing it down. The acrylic almost doesn't have um, that level of gravity. For the um, second application, the one with the enormous amount of aluminum steering, mm -hmm. uh, what are we looking at in terms of the drying time where you reasonably, you know, it's, I'm not saying the entire film, but at least where if you move it or move it around. Where dry to touch? Not just dry to touch, but dry to move around without a fear that it is going to get uh, you know, separated from the ground. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I feel like that's going to keep um, drooping down at least for another like half hour. Mm -hmm. So I have to kind of play with that. I know that if I probably would have used champagne chalk, it, it wouldn't have been as heavy. Maybe it wouldn't have drooped down as much. So I often always have paintings like this just to test those, those areas. I think it's important to do that because you never... I, I, I like to bend those rules and see what's, what's going to happen. Um, so I do have a, again, I go back to having a firm understanding of what the medium is and then you can play around with it. So I guess that it, that it will take another like half hour to be stiff. Yeah, it should be stiff yeah. by tomorrow. You can be reasonably confident. Yeah, it should be dry to touch, but I always, I would always wait at least a week before you do another another layer. Just to, okay. just to have some kind of a... But if you had to move it around, let's say tomorrow, let's say you want to take it from here to another location, you would not be worried about the other getting this lost. I would. You would? Yeah. Okay, so that's a good idea about moving into another location. I mean, I guess that's a good uh, um, gauge, right? Yes, that's what I'm asking. So yeah. How long would you be because comfortable? I, I would be comfortable moving it around at least, again, at least a week probably after ah. after it's dry to touch. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, so that... Uh,
That recipe was alkyl resin AH. And I use uh, Studio Yellow in the room. Um, I didn't name the second one, but the second one was fast drying. And the third one I'm gonna call gunk. Gunk. Um, the the next one I'm gonna make is uh, uh what was it? Um, refined linseed. Um, was it slow drying oil? and uh, a translucent iron oxide and with mica. Now, I will give a little explanation of the slow drying oil. The slow drying oil has a uh, colophony in it, um, again, which is a very hard resin. Um, it has guano oil um, and it has silver, and it has a double rectified um, turpentine, so it dries very, very slow. Um, it's a very, very thin um, paint as well, but it's extremely slow drying, so it'll, it'll take about a month to dry at a, at approximately one to five ratio of oil to pigment, again, depending on the pigment. Um, so I'm gonna use slow drying oil. It's a very slow drying uh, oil that's gonna allow me to work on top of it, um, keep working on it. I'm gonna use translucent iron oxide. It's an extremely fine particle size uh, pigment where, which is completely translucent and therefore I'm going to have a much richer glow. And I'm going to use mica. I'm going to use powdered mica. Um, and this is a kind of pearlescent um, uh, um, color, a kind of pearlescent white. Um, I'm mixing this because uh, I, I, I mix this medium um, which resembles a lot of uh, recipes that violin makers use. And so I like to use this on, on things like wood, for example, any like uh, panel pieces I'm gonna paint without a, a ground. Or I would use this on, on, you can also use this as a glaze. So if you wanna change the tone of, of any opaque color, you can do a thin layer of this glaze and it'll give you a very rich glow from whatever color underneath um, you're painting on the top of. Um, and so the translucent iron oxide is more of a, is kind of a neutral pigment. It doesn't uh, dry fast and it doesn't dry slow. And so that variable for me is kind of thrown out. What I'm trying to balance is the ratio between um, the slow drying oil and the mica. The mica is extremely light, so it'll dry somewhat uh, slow, and so is the slow drying oil. So I'm gonna do this as a thin layer, which I can later, um, push the paint around and draw with. And what I mean by that is while it's still wet, I'm gonna try to do a very, very thin glaze. And while it's still wet, I'm gonna grab the blunt part of my brush and kind of draw and, and push out the paint away. So this is one technique that you can use to kind of um, mask certain areas or, or uh, um, create a kind of a ridge or a valley of paint. That way you can have more control in the edges. Um, that's actually very vague if you didn't follow me there for a second. But I, I will explain what I mean by that. Um, with paint a lot of times, uh, I try to think of it as, as, as you're pushing it around, right? Essentially we are. Um, so if somehow you want a very, very sharp edge um, in acrylic, you can tape it and put uh, acrylic medium on top. When you lift up the tape, it will actually create a very sharp, hard edge where you lifted the tape that way any paint that um, goes along that edge has a kind of wall, if you will, to where it stops. And therefore, visually, optically, this edge is, is, is gonna be very sharp. We see this edge happen a lot in Rembrandt paintings. Um, that very stark, dark, uh, bluish um, color from 52-300. Iron oxide. It's iron oxide. Okay. So it's a natural um, paint. Now, uh, 
when for a second there, I forgot that there's extremely high tinting strengths, high tinting um, pigments. So I'm gonna need less, much less than that. I don't add if I if I if I need to. Because it's very thin, you don't need as much oil. It's also strong smelling. Can you see this? Oh, we don't have. So which is the oil again? It's a slow drying medium. And it's a camera made product. Uh, I mean, meaning it's our own recipe. It's uh, I believe Palafini Bono oil and uh, it's kind of a special boiling point uh, spirit or turpentine. Try this again and see if it works. I don't think it's really loud, I guess. about the um, formation of the film uh, in the aluminum stearate, uh, the, 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 the second uh, uh, rendition of the yellow. Uh -huh. um, so again, giving it, let's say, a week or two or even three, uh, once the matrix, the matrix is formed, the matrix would actually, am I correct in understanding, would be not only at the surface and in the pigment, it would actually penetrate the ground. Right? That's, That's what causes the adhesion. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. In the various liquids that you have uh, shown us today, or, or, or I'm sure there's many, many, many more that your company makes and makes available, is there any adhesive? Is there any what? Adhesive. Adhesive liquid that you sell? Like an adhesive, you mean? Uh, and, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. uh, like an um, acrylic is an adhesive. So, yeah. Is there something equivalent to that that you, you sell? Mean like a glue? Is that what yes, yes, yes. Acrylic is a glue, technically. Right. Yeah. Well, acrylic is just like a, yeah, it's just like a, like a plastic. It's like a liquid. Yeah, it's like a liquid glue. And the reason why we call it glue is because if you put something on it, it's gonna dry with it. Exactly. So it's so it's adhering to whatever surface you're painting on. You can uh -huh. essentially do that with oil, uh -huh. but because of the oil, oily, because of the oiliness and because of the oxidation process that we're talking about. It's very slow. It, it is slow and right. it can rot whatever paper or whatever thing you want to adhere with. True. It's also slow drying. That slow drying process will prevent it from adhering to whatever object or paper that they want to lodge or they want to adhere to. So essentially you can adhere with, with anything. I mean, um, True. you know, egg, for example, is yeah. a, it's a good binder. True. Um, and we know this with, uh, you know, with pastries and whatever um, food products and stuff, but we know there's also a template thing. Um, which is, you know, it's just egg yolk and, uh, uh, egg yolk and pigment. So, right, so, so my question actually was, is there something within the oil universe which is similar in terms of its, uh, not adhesive properties, as you explained, they're the same, but in terms of its rate of drying as what we get in the polymer oil, uh -huh. which is where acrylic resin is drying literally in seconds or faster. Yeah. So I was wondering, is there anything in the oil world which approaches that level? No, oh. there, there really isn't. That's a great question, and I think that that's uh, I mean that's the reason why you would choose one medium or the other. Mm -hmm. You can manipulate oil to act like acrylic, and you can make acrylic act like oil. But when, when in those uh, microscopic uh, chemistry, if you will, and the way that it adheres um, chemically is not binding; it's mm -hmm. hugging. 
Right, right. And, and so, and, and so you're, you're, you're not going to create a very strong adhesion. Right. So that's why you would use acrylic polymers for, for that. That's why Elmer's glue is, a, is an acrylic. Correct. It's a kind of PVA, polyvinyl yes. um, alcohol. So with this pigment, um, what's very fascinating is that uh, it's very, it feels very oily. But I can feel how somewhat from the iron oxide, it's somewhat hard. So I know that if I mull it, it's gonna um, be even more translucent. So with, trans with, with uh, working with translucent colors, it's always very nice to mull it um, because this will make it even more translucent. And you want translucent colors uh, generally because you want to create layers. And again, the way that light is passing through those layers is very important for luminosity. If that's something that you want to do. Again, there's no rules to, to either thing. And, uh, a question about the yellow yellow blue leaf, that's an organic pigment? Uh, they call it synthetic organic. Yes, yes. It means it's, it's uh, made synthetically, chemically, yeah. with organic chemistry. Right. It's not a mineral. It's not a mineral. Right. Um, the reason you don't use a lot of times you don't you don't use uh, mineral pigments for the first layers is because the way that the oil is coating the mineral it prevents the mineral from from being true to its physical nature. But isn't amber a mineral? I'm sorry. Amber, the one that you use. Is it white? Isn't that is it a mineral? mineral? Yes, I, I um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, you're right. It is a mineral. Besides earth, I meant like 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 precious metals, like historical metals, like azure, malachite, um, lapis. Uh, you're right. That is those are ores or umbers or ochres, and so that is a kind of mineral. Um, what I what I meant to say is that the coarser um, uh, historical minerals, you use them in the final layers because of their hardness. When you when you when you coat it with oil, you start to lose that intensity. Uh, from that color. So for example with lapis, you don't, you generally don't paint oil with lapis. You can do that at the final layers where the, where the lapis would just kind of sit on the surface of whatever you're painting on. So you glaze with lapis. You don't do browns with lapis. Because you're just going to lose a very intense rich blue from the grounds that's not necessarily going to shine through. So the first colors that you want on the spotlight if you will, are your final blues. Um, so this is somewhat true with, with all coarser minerals. Um, you want them at the final layers in the glazing layers because this will, this will allow light to pass through the So where the limited oil is used is what you're saying. Am I hearing you correctly, sir? No, you can use a lot of oil. I mean, we're talking about the coarseness of the pigments, the particle size of the pigment. You want something that's coarser. As far as something that's oily, as long as you're going through that oil over um, uh -huh, uh -huh. fat over lean rule, then you can have, um, I got your point. then it doesn't matter what So what you're saying is you use the coarser pigments for the higher layers and the yes. finer pigments for the lower layers. It's because of the, the way, and this is something I explained, I'll explain this again, and I think it's something we're always going to continue doing. I'm going to attempt to do this, but this is something that I always try to explain here in the store. Imagine this is your ground. You're creating different layers of paint. The way the light is, 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 is passing through is from this direction, right? And the way that we get color, the way that we get spectrum, is from light bouncing back through those layers, and you're essentially going to get color. So when you do coarser, when you do fine um, opaque pigments or, or finer particle pigments in the first layers, um, you're going to have a good foundation for this, for this structure, right? So you're going to use coarser pigments. As you start to get to the final layers, you, I mean, you're going to use finer pigments. As, as you get to the final layers, you're going to get coarser pigments. Which means so larger particle that, size. You yes. Right. Um, fine, um, coarser particle size. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the way that light is pass, passing through this is it's being it's more dynamic than if we were to go to this more solid area. Got it. So the way that you're getting light bouncing back at you, it's much more um, brilliant. Wonderful.
So you can play with that, that those dynamics by messing around with that with that structure. Now you're saying you're producing the blaze. I'm trying to apply what you just said, but this must be an extremely small particle size now that you're using it. It is. So but I know right the now mica, which is going to change the particle size. It is, but uh, essentially this is still this is still very concentrated. I can still dilute this a lot. Mm -hmm. I want to I dilute it even further. I want to put just a small thing of turpentine. Again, it's going to evaporate. It'll change the body of the paint, but I know it won't be there in the final in the final layer. So as you can see, as, I, as I'm like starting to push it into it, it's going to start getting much more translucent. The, the pigment's starting to break down. Another reason, I guess, why I can't have this class for longer than two hours is because I don't want to expose you to the smell. It's starting to smell. So if you can see, you can get a much more transparent, transparent paint. And now I'm going to add about 20% of, of mica to, uh, to the final volume of paint. You sell mica at many different particle sizes, right? Right, but this is just powdered mica. You can't use the, the coarser mica uh -huh. with oil uh -huh. because it becomes uh, like slush. Uh -huh. It doesn't dissolve. Mica is is like pellets. So like it can stop the stop the film from falling. Form. Yes, and it'll, so it just become like a obstruction. It'll become um, again like a, it becomes just like like uh, obstruction to that. A dagger through the film. Yeah. So it'll, it'll just be it'll be like glitter, really. I'm gonna adjust. I need to add more oil. What if you're trying to make a, a an extremely dull pastel-like uh, film? Just use a lot of champagne chalk. And again, it goes back to the intensity. The less pigment you have, um, the less uh, essentially light and color you're gonna get. So if you use something that's colorless, that's just replacing that light, then you're gonna get a much more dull, dull, um, much more uh, saturated paint. So what you would use if you want a very chalky looking surface? Yes. yes, just use as little, as little pigment as, as possible. Lower the, the, the ratio of pigment. And you're working very fast because this dries very fast? I'm working very fast because I had too much coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But with this hard pigment, the more you, again, the more you grind it, the more translucent it will get. And the more oily it will get, because the oils are, are, are distributing it. When you say hard, you refer to the most number, MOHS? I'm sorry, say that again? When you say hard pigment, you refer to the most number, MOHS number? No, I'm referring to the, hard, the tactile, physical hardness to it. Yeah, like palm is soft, table is hard. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's the most number. So, you know, as, as a material, I, I don't know where that, where that, where that level of gauge is. I'm okay. probably hearing it wrong. Saying it's a, it's a kind of level of measuring hardness? Yeah. Like diamond is the hardest for you. Right, right. So I'm adjusting. Um, I'm using a very soft hairbrush. I want to do a glaze. And from my experience of painting on this panel already, I know it's very coarse. So I know that it's not going to allow, allow me to make a, a very um, fluid paint film. So I'm going to dilute it just a little further. Again, the important thing about not measuring is because since you're, if you're going to make, since you're not going to precisely make your ground the same every single time, your ratio cannot be the same every single time. It could only be the same in that painting, right? And so if you keep a log of this ratio, then you can make the paint the same every single time. But in this case, I like to go by field because I'm, I'm beginning to paint this painting. So I don't have those ratios down yet. If this is a color that I know I'm gonna use a lot of, I would have measured this so I can control that, that recipe in the remainder of the painting. So this is much better now.
with this medium, though, um, you can also see less brush strokes for the finer part of the things. But in that, in that wash that I just did, in that glaze, you can see the particles from the treatment itself. But I'm not going to cover this whole square because from looking at the at the um, the way that it will dry, I really love the way that it's it's going to have a much shinier surface to the to the colors around it. So I'm not going to cover the whole square. And I'll put when it dries, I'll put a, a, a thin layer that way it can be more. Um, um, I can shift that color. I can create another pink for me. So you can do stuff like that. And that's what I'm going to push my paint on. So in those valleys that I'm creating, you're going to get a much sharper edge if you were to make a solid color down there. Because you're creating a wall that prevents it from, it, it, it's allowing to make a sharper um, edge along the bridge. So if you ever want to make a sharper edge, you can choose how that color is going to glide on top of that other picture. So, See, that's the, that's the fast drying oil medium and it barely like sunk in there. So essentially it's just like a, that first layer. So what happens when you do that, you know, you can push that paint around and it almost doesn't, doesn't stay there anymore. So it's just the drawing. Does that make any sense what I'm explaining there? Do you understand? Um, I feel like I lost you. Yeah. Yeah, we're lost. You're lost? <laughs> I am anyway. I don't know about the others. I'm glad I asked. Um, when I was talking about the pastel colors and the way that you're the way that you're gonna use the surface or the pigment in order to cling onto the brush, it's the same way that I'm explaining the kind of ridges I'm making with paint, right? So when you see this edge right here, you create, you're creating a, a, a kind of wall, kind of sharper edge, right? With the with the drawing underneath, because it's 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 uh, it's barely enough in a binder, the pigment is just sitting on the surface. So the way that this the, the way that the you're developing the the values, um, you're gonna have much more control and sharpness because of the way that the, that the paint is clinging onto that particle of pigment. So when I talk about ridges, when I talk about making ridges, that paint film, you, it, um, depending on how thin or thick that paint film, you're gonna have a sharper ridge. Depending on how um, fine particle size that ground is, you're gonna have a sharper line when you go over it. I see. So all these things have are important when trying to control um, sharpness, trying to control line, essentially. Um, but what, when you rub your finger over the um, you know, raw umber, are you removing pigment, or are you just smearing it out of the way? No, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm smearing it, I'm pushing it out of the way. Because if I was removing pigment completely, this would be completely white, right? So this tells me that this binder didn't have, it wasn't all a binder. It didn't stay very permanent, it's coming off of my... And with the ground layers, with the first cartoon sketch, you kind of want that. You don't want it to be completely... So um, for the idea of control of, of line. So in, in sketching, you want a control of line. But is that because you don't have that much pigment and you have uh, the black oil? Is the black oil the element? The black oil is just the element that's making it dry really fast. This element which is, is, is allowing you to make it very quick drying. Because the paint. difference between the raw umber and the ultramarine is just that you have a lot of oil <coughs> with the ultramarine, less oil with the raw umber, and and you have some black oil. Right? Yeah. 
or is it a, a, the nature of the law? Well, it, it's a combination of both, and that's exactly what I'm trying to explain. Because the ultramarine is, is very different from raw umber in, in the drying time. So, so in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm creating, I'm just pointing out that balance. And I'm pointing out that you can control sharpness with that coarseness of the ground. You can not control sharpness if you want. You can make it very fluid, um, like this. You know, that, that's, I mean, the paint is just, uh, it, it's just uh, being pushed along with the other remaining paint. So if you so try to make the sharp line with the blue or the yellow, you would not be able to do it the way you, you are. You won't, exactly, you won't be able exactly. to do it as efficient. Right, right, right. So right. raw umber is a choice in the ground in order to do it much more more efficiently, much mm -hmm. quicker mm -hmm. drying time. You want to finish the, the sketch, that way you can start creating value, you can start creating the painting. So you're not so you're not thinking too much about about the 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 aesthetic of that paint film. You're only thinking about the structure of the paint film. And it's a good enough structure. You could always just just uh, rub it off if you want, and it'll be even less pigment. So it won't change the color of, of whatever paint you're putting on top. Or you could create create more binder, and it'll be much more permanent. That way, it won't rub off. I'm I'm being I'm trying to make errors, and I'm trying to make this painting with you, so you can see the different possibilities. Um, because this is something that I don't I'm not, I don't always have complete control of in my own work, and I like that. I like that experience, and I think that's very much the idea of painting. I'm not I'm not a crafts person that tries to make the same um, object over and over again. If you do want to go that route, then you can, and then you know that you can measure these things out in order to be able to. Um, make the paint however you want it to look. But I do just want to give you that understanding of the different variables that you can use in, with your own painting. And I'm just giving you some of my own recipes that, that I, that I, uh, that I um, play around with myself. Um, can you write that last one on the Yes, thank you. Slow dry, we also saw a fast drying oil. This is slow drying oil. The fast, fast drying oil just has a, um, a dryer. It makes it dry much quicker. They're the same physical properties, the, the drying time just changes. The slow drying oil is 79210, if you're interested. Uh, the translucent iron oxide is an orange. And Michael Potter. 